Welcome to Email After Hours by Senderscore, powered by Validity. We're your hosts. My name's Guy Hanson. And I'm Danielle Gallant, and this is Email After Hours. Hi, everybody. Today, we're going to be talking about those wonderful messages that reach the right subscribers at the right time and with the right content. And those are, of course, automated emails. We'll be looking into how to use automation, how you can leverage it to achieve the best possible results. And Guy, we've got an expert here to chat with us about this, right? We absolutely do. I like to think we're experts, but this one puts us in our place. A real pleasure to welcome Gene Jennings to Email After Hours. We'll start off with some quick introductions, but almost feel for a lot of our audience, they might not even be necessary. I mean, what can I say? You're a consultant, you're a trainer, you're a speaker, you're an author. You know, everybody knows you because of your role with Only Influencers and Email Innovation Summit and more. But just in case there's a few people listening in today that haven't come across you before, who are you? Well, thank you. I'm blushing now. Thank you for that lovely introduction. My name is Jean Jennings. I'm an email marketing strategist. I'm an avowed email geek, as I bet you guys are too. I have my own boutique consultancy, Email Optimization Shop, and I work with medium enterprise-sized companies, helping them optimize their email, basically improving their bottom line. And then the other hat that I wear, which I was doing last night, is I'm actually an adjunct professor at Georgetown University in the graduate program. So that's actually where I got my master's degree from, my MBA. And I teach typically one or maybe two classes a year. It's digital marketing. So we only get to talk about email for one of the classes, and then we cover all the other channels. That's awesome. When do you sleep, (laughs) Jean? Sorry. I know. I know. A lot of people say that. Now, you've been in the world of email for about as long as I have. I think the only difference is I've got the gray hairs to prove it. But you've worked with clients ranging from AARP, Capital One, Hasbro, Mayo Clinic, Verizon, Weight Watchers. I think great for Daniel and myself is a lot of those are validity clients too. So we've clearly got a great overlap there. What would you say are some of the most common challenges that you've had to encounter and help them to solve for as you sort of worked with all of those big names? Yeah. You know, I think it's interesting. When I go into a client, what we're really looking to do is bottom line performance. So it's more sort of looking at what they're doing and figuring out what they're doing right. And then how can we do more of that? Looking at things that aren't working real well, and then figuring out if there's ways we can make them work better, or sometimes you just need to retire them. And then figuring out what they're not doing and helping them implement that. So it's really kind of those things, you know, the companies that hire me, it's not so much that they hire me because they have a problem. It's more that they hire me because they've reached a plateau with their performance and they just don't feel like they're able to get more out of the channel. And I come in and show them how to get more out of the channel. And, you know, there's a great quote from, I think it's Joe Torre, who's like a baseball player. And pardon me, not to be weird, but um, it's like sex is like pizza. When it's great, it's really great. And even when it's not so good, it's still pretty okay. Um, <laughs> and I think that, you know, email is kind of like that. I think a lot of companies are like, hey, you know, our email program, it's making money, it's profitable. We won't invest a lot more there because it's good. And yet when you actually do start investing a little bit more in email, and it's not even money so much as it is just thought, all of a sudden it becomes supercharged. And then you're seeing, you know, 50%, 100% increase in the revenue that it's generating. And so that's really what I do for my clients. I really love the idea of let's start with what you're doing well and amplify it. Let's do more of that. And I think one of those tactics is today's big topic. So uh, how about it, Danielle? That's absolutely right. Speaking of amplifying it and ways to just maximize what you've got, let's talk about email automation. So it's 2023, headcounts are smaller, budgets are tighter. What makes email automation a particularly important part of the marketer's tool set right now? Email is great because it allows you to do more with less it helps you be more productive, especially in recessionary times. Because if you think about it, you know, the time that you're spending and so many companies are in this sort of, you know, got to get the email out, got to get the email out. I talk to especially junior email marketers and they're just on this treadmill and they're just trying to keep up. And so what automation does is, you know, you put the work in once and then it just goes. And there's benefits on both sides. There's benefits to the team because once it's set up and it's going, you don't have to spend that time every send. 
And there's also benefits for your customers and your prospects because automation done properly lets you deliver more relevant content in a timely manner. And so it's better for the people who are receiving it as well. I think the key is automation done well, which is what we're talking about today. I think in the last couple of years, there's been a real push to automate, but it hasn't necessarily been as strategic as it needs to be. There's a famous Bill Gates quote about, you know, automating something that's efficient increases the efficiency, but automating something that's inefficient increases the inefficiency. So that's really the key is making sure you're automating the correct things and making sure you're doing automation in a strategic fashion. If you have an email that just doesn't work, automating, it's not going to make it work better. And I'm going to move into a topic or really even a phrase that I think for me, it makes me cringe. And I'm sure for a lot of marketers, it also makes them cringe. That is batch and blast sense. So why is automation more effective than your traditional batch and blast send? Yeah. You know, it's really the relevance. If you think about automation, if it's done properly, it is the ultimate in segmentation, targeting, and relevance. Think about an abandoned cart email, for instance. You've got a segment of one, literally one. The content you're sending them is the products that they left in their shopping cart. How relevant is that? I mean, that's perfect targeting. And so it's kind of the perfect storm. So that's really the key to success. I actually, back in 2015, was working with a client and they were a test prep company. So you know how your children take the SATs to get in the college and then you have to take like the MCATs to get into med school. They're providing preparation so that you'll do better on those tests. So they know when those tests are being held. They know which one you're planning to take. And they have this limited window to market their services to you because at some point it's too late. And so literally we mapped out a plan for them where we were going to automate everything they sent because we we could because we knew the timing of it and it was you know months not years and so that is really the key and by doing that it freed time up it's not that we were looking to cut staff no 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 it's that we were looking to free the staff up so instead of being on this constant got to get the email out treadmill they were on a ooh, let me look at this automation and figure out what we can A-B split test to optimize it. Let's see how we can get more out of this. And so it makes the work for the team much more interesting. And again, it's a better experience for the recipients. So not every business can do that, but we literally had, you know, here is the life cycle. Here are the things that they do. And then here's how we're going to automate. And we had all these different threads and it was, some of it was based on the actions they took. And some of it was based on the timing we knew we had. It was interesting because when we did the analysis, we found they used to do these informational webinars to talk about their services and the tests. And we found that people who attended those informational webinars were much more likely to buy. And we knew when was the right time to do those webinars. And so we just, we automated all of it. We made sure that every person who got into the funnel had two chances to hit a webinar. And then we did a lot around trying to get people to those webinars. So that was like really cool. And and again, you know, literally automating all of the communications. They still do some one-offs once in a while, but it's pretty much automated and it's like you're just creating a money machine, right? Because you know what you need them to do and you know when to do things. And if somebody signs up for the webinar, but they don't attend, there's an email that gets sent. If they did attend, it's a different. And so it was just really cool. And again, not to take people out of it, but to elevate people so that they're doing more interesting work. I was speaking to one of our clients on a webinar recently, and he's introduced a load of automation into his program over the past months. And he told me such a funny story because he'd been talking to his MD about all of the automation. And his boss said words to the effect of, you know, anything which makes money for me while I'm fast asleep is good in my book. And yeah, that made us laugh. But more seriously, you know, especially when it comes to marketing emails, I think, yeah, one of the big attractions of automated emails is that, you know, there's plenty of research to suggest that the average revenue per email is a load higher than your sort of business as usual emails oh, yeah. for all of the reasons that you just outlined. But do you think there's sort of one particular type of automated email, which maybe sort of stands head and shoulders above the others when it comes to revenue effectiveness? You know, is it maybe those basket abandonment emails that catch those almost buyers in the moment, perhaps? 
So tempting. Yeah, no, definitely. Whenever I work with a client, there's a couple of things that we look at to figure out where to start with automation. But the first thing you want to look at is you want to look at your sales funnel. And when you're automating things, you want to start at the bottom and work up. Mm. Because the closer you are to that sale, the more revenue you're going to bring in. Like card abandonment emails are a perfect example. If they were interested enough to put that in their cart and then they walked away, you have a good chance of a conversion. And a conversion there means a lot more because that's actually literally a sale. I'll never forget this. I always interview everyone on the team to try to understand what their pain points are and the challenges and ideas that they have. And one of the things on her to-do list, when she had time on a Friday, she would go in and manually send card abandonment emails because the systems didn't talk to each other. So she would literally download the data from one system, upload it into the ESP. I don't think they had any information on what was in the cart. She just could identify people who had stuff in their cart whose email addresses they had. Upload it. This generic cart email that just basically said, you left some stuff in your cart. Would you want to come back? And she only did it on Fridays when she had time. So it didn't go out all the time. And she did it for everyone like since she had last sent it. So some people might have been three hours from a card abandonment. Some might have been three days. Some could have been three weeks. We found out that that email was generating $18 for every email that they sent. Wow. $18. Can you imagine if we each had $18 for every email that we sent? I mean... We would be rock stars. Wow. We almost need more time on a Friday afternoon. I know. A casual Friday task is really pulling the <laughs> weight there. Yeah. So that was one where it was just like, this is a no brainer. I don't even care what it takes to get the integration in place. So she doesn't have to do it manually anymore. Mm. We just need to get the integration in place. And again, this is without any personalization on product types get the integration in place so that this goes out. And again, with a card abandoned, it's not one, it's usually at least three and set it up so that, you know, three hours, 24 hours, 48, whatever, you know, every cadence is different. But yeah, there's stuff like that, that people are doing. And then when you dig into it, so yeah, that's really important. So, and that's the other thing I take a look at, what are you doing manually that we could automate that would take that off that person's plate? Follow-up actions are really great. So that would be like a browse abandonment or someone downloads a white paper. I don't know about y'all. How many times do you download a white paper and you never hear from the company again. Or if you do hear from them, they don't mention that they know that you downloaded the white paper. So there's a lot of things like that. Any action that someone takes, that is a perfect place to look at automations. When we do automations, we take a look at what the potential return is. And typically, closer to the bottom of funnel is typically a higher potential return. The number of emails that would be sent typically factor into that. But then we also take a look on the other side at what's it going to take to get this in place. Do we have to do data integration? Do we have to, Mm. what do we have to do? Uh, Do we have an email we're already sending or do we have to create an email? And then ranking that, it becomes very clear. You want to do the things with high potential and low time and resources to implement. And then you rank them like that and kind of go down the list. You've mentioned starting from the end point and then moving back up. But in working with clients, I know that for senders who don't have automated messages as a part of their email program, getting started can seem really daunting and like a huge task that needs to be tackled. So as senders start building out campaign automation workflows, what are some of the most important elements that they should consider in terms of maybe, you know, you've already mentioned data quality, technology integration, what else, like where can we start with this? So it's really important to start simple. I think that's one thing a lot of people often miss and start simple in a couple ways. Start simple by having one goal. One thing I often do when I do automations is I map out the workflow, and that's very important. Working on an automation doesn't start in your system. It literally starts with a piece of paper (laughs) and a pencil. I like pencils so you can erase and figuring out, you know, what your goal is and how you're going to get there. And that's really important. One thing about automations is they have a much longer shelf life. They're going to be running longer than a single campaign that you send than a business as usual campaign. And so you want to put the time in on the front with the strategy to really make sure that it's going to shine. I like to start with figuring out, you know, A, what do we want them to do? And then what are the features, benefits, advantages associated with that that are going to get them to take that action? Once you understand what the features, benefits, and advantages are, what I do is I use those to create a message map. So a message map basically says, what are we going to talk about? Because 
having one email and sending it six times isn't really a great automation. You want to think in terms of a series. So for instance, I did a series for a government entity a while back and we were like, well, we can help you with transparency. We can help you with this. So figure out how you're helping them. And then typically what I do with my automations when I'm starting is with the message map, I figure out what are like the key things that I need to mention. So it might be, you know, here's a benefit and there's a white paper you can download associated with that. Here's a different benefit. Everybody has different hot buttons. So you may be looking for cost savings. Somebody else may be looking for, you know, additional features. By giving each of those a little more in-depth treatment in an email and stringing them together, maybe the first one doesn't hit strong, but the second one hit is exactly what I'm looking for. So once I get that message map of features of, you know, typically advantages or benefits, then I actually bookend them. So I like to start with one that touches on all four or six or however many we have. And then each of the next ones goes into detail. And then the last one kind of wraps it up. That's really key. Each of those emails should stand alone, but together they should be greater than the sum of their parts. And so that's really important. So figuring out not only what you want them to do, but what the advantages and benefits you want to mention to drive that action are, and then putting that together in a natural series. And I think that's the key that I see a lot of people missing. And yet it takes a little time, but that's really what's going to drive your success is, is really starting there. And again, trying to keep it simple. Oftentimes I'll go to a client, we'll have an automation. They'll be like, oh yeah, for the people who don't do that, we should do this with them. We can do that with them. So I always have, you know, little boxes that say, you know, to come, to come, because it's easy to build this big, huge monster but it takes a lot of time to develop that. You really want to work in an agile fashion. So build something small, build one piece and then build another piece and maybe they connect and maybe they're separate. But that I think is really important too. A lot of people try to, what do they call it? Boiling the ocean. Mm. (laughs) Don't do that. (laughs) Start really simple. And you know, there's no reason if you, you know, let's say that you think you want to have a 10 effort series. There's no reason you can't start with a three effort series and then add efforts as you go and add efforts as you learn. So I think that's the biggest key is keeping it simple, but having a real strong feeling for what the content's gonna be and how that's gonna be successful. The other thing I think is really important, this is one of the biggest mistakes I see people making is they don't have their bottom line call to action in every email. And that's a real problem. I just read one yesterday, somebody sent me a document from one of the ESPs and it says one call to action per email. And I'm like, that's not really it. Because just because you're asking them to download the white paper, but maybe your end goal is that they talk to a rep, make sure both of those things are in an email because Mm. they might download that white paper, but they also might actually be ready to talk to a rep. We've presented automation so far as this fabulous good news story, and it is, but (laughs) if it was that easy, everyone would be doing a load more of it. But It's kind of like you said a little bit earlier in the conversation, you know, you've got to start from the right position. You know, it's kind of like feeding bad data into your AI model. You're going to get a bad AI model. You know, if you sort of build off a bad premise, you're going to get a bad solution. So what are the pitfalls that an email marketing program needs to think about when it's starting to build out some automation? What are the things that could potentially go wrong if they don't think about it carefully enough? Yeah, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. I had a client that was sending an automated email. And when I looked at the analysis, I found that the unsubscribe rate was higher than the conversion rate. No, no. Yeah. 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 And, you know, I think a lot of these fall under, you can't actually set it and forget it, Mm -hmm. which I think a lot of people sell automation is you set it up and you forget it and it just, it throws off money and you're all good, but you really need to be looking at it. It's funny. I remember I called them and I'm like, look, I'm not going to give you your readouts until, you know, a week from now, but you need to turn this campaign off today. (laughs) Today. It was a global unsubscribe. Mm. So if they got off, they got off. So that's a big one. The other thing I think automation's gone wrong. There was a a B2B company. I, I think I downloaded a white paper and then I got in this horrible loop. They were sending me the same email about that white paper every day. And I actually reached out to someone who I knew at the company. I said, I think there might be a problem. And he was like, holy moly. And uh, and he fixed it. The other good one is there's a hotel chain that I really like. It's where I always stay. Any of us who travel a lot, you kind of, I like the points. I'm a point person. But it got to be kind of a running joke. I typically will browse and take a look at, you know, hotels in the region. And then sometimes I just have to think about it. Sometimes I need to actually submit and get approval 
from the client if they're paying, which isn't usually a problem, but I don't like to book before I have approval. And I would check into the hotel and I would literally get an email saying, hey, are you still considering your trip here? Do you like to book a hotel? It is so funny that you mentioned that because last week I was speaking with Guy. I opted into, I purchased like a part of a monthly subscription company. I won't name names here, but I just opted in, was really excited, got my first, you know, whatever monthly package. And it felt like there was no interplay between the automated emails and the promotional messages that were going. I was continuously being promoted to for something that I already purchased. And we're talking like a long time. It's not just the day after. It's like weeks after. So sometimes there is that disconnect even within one program. You need to think through it. And I could look at that. And again, it, it happened for like a year. I knew exactly what was happening. They didn't have any logic in there to say, so they browsed and they didn't book in that session, but there was no logic in there to say, but did they book at a later session? So I understood what was happening, but I mean, it was just a right. I ended up writing a blog post about it because it just kept happening. (laughs) Take it to the blog. So again, another reason you want to think through the whole process, you know, and I get it. A lot of companies like, well, you know, those systems don't talk to each other. Well, okay. But you know, you're looking silly. And, you know, that's another thing, right? Like if you as a recipient get a lot of irrelevant emails, especially automated ones, you're going to stop opening because after a while you're going to figure it's not relevant and you're just going to stop opening. So there's a lot of mistakes that can happen. And that's another reason, you know, it's just, it's not set it and forget it and it never should be. And, you know, you should have people on your staff who are testing that. And you should be looking at your automations. You know, if you're doing A-B split testing, you should be looking at your automations. But, you know, in general, so for instance, with that unsubscribe rate that was so high, you should be looking at all of the metrics for your automations, at least on a monthly basis. There should be a monthly report that happens. And then I really tell people you should really check your automations at least every three to six months and make Mm -hmm. sure everything's running right. Typically, what I do with my clients is we put together a schedule. And so in January, we check these three. In February, we check these three. And in addition to checking to make sure they're working, it also gives you an opportunity to look at them and come up with hypotheses about what you might test to boost performance, because that's why we've automated them, right? To free up time for testing. So yeah, it's very easy for automations to go wrong. And again, like with that company that was sending me the email every single day, the damage can be much greater than if a regular business as usual email went wrong. Absolutely. And I think you've given us the perfect segue here in terms of just monitoring and making sure you have a schedule to check these things. In working with clients, we're often monitoring deliverability or inbox performance for those bigger promotional campaigns, the ones that have all eyes on them within a company. So what is the role of good deliverability when you are sending campaigns that aren't really being monitored every day. Some of my clients ask like, should I really be testing this? This is a small audience. You know, we're only seeding it to Everest once every couple of months. Is this something that we should be paying attention to? Definitely, because automated emails have an opportunity to get very high revenue per email generation. And so deliverability is even more critical. Imagine if that $18 per email sent card abandonment email suddenly went into spam or just disappeared. That's a huge chunk of revenue that your company is missing. Mm -hmm. So deliverability is really critical. I think it's so important. And I think that there's a lot of misconceptions out there about deliverability. I mean, I'm sure you've all seen it. You know, I say to people, I think we might have a deliverability problem and taking a look at this. And they'll be like, no, no, no. Don't you see in the ESP, we have 97% deliverability, only 3% bounced. And I'm like, you know, it's a problem. We really should have different words because it's a different thing. You're preaching to the choir on that one. Yeah, you understand. Times have really changed. You know, I'm showing my age. I've been working in online since 1989. Um, I've been working in email specifically since 2000. And, you know, I remember I worked for a big toy company back in like 2003. They were my first really big client. And our ESP, God bless them, had a relationship with the places we're delivering to. And we got a call, you know, hey, AOL is blocking everything in this send. We found out about it pretty quickly. We stopped the rest of the send. And it's something quirky in the code. We've talked to them. They understand it's not malicious, but they've asked us to change it. We're working on that now. And then we're going to resend it. And it was just proactive and they were great. And I don't think having just an ESP isn't necessarily enough anymore. Things have really changed. It's really more of a commoditized product. We pay a lot less, which is great. 
but the service levels are not there. And especially, you know, I've worked with clients that are doing things that are risky. Anytime you don't have a hundred percent opt-in list, that's a higher business risk for deliverability. And so you really do need outside help, someone like a validity. And, you know, it's not just those people, but honestly, if your list is not a hundred percent opt-in, I can pretty much definitively say you need someone like validity because you are at a much higher risk to have these problems. This has been such a awesome conversation. I think, you know, you've given our listeners so many fantastic tips. You know, if you're thinking about starting out with email automation or sort of building on your initial efforts and and I've just been writing down the notes as you've been talking, but, you know, common sense principles, start simple, build from the bottom, you know, make sure that you don't sort of set and forget because you're going to get tripped up by that. But do you have maybe one more automation gold nugget that you could share with our audience, you know, if there's absolutely nothing else you do, do this? I think I would just say, just get started. Mm. As you said, Danielle, it can be so daunting to think about people think it has to be big and fancy and 20 efforts and no, just kind of get started. And that is really, I think the most important thing, but again, be smart about it. And, you know, if you need to, there's a lot out there. When I started an email in 2000, I mean, I was writing for Click Z, and there were a couple of us who were, there wasn't a whole lot of information out there. And when I started online in 89, gosh, we didn't even call it the cutting edge. My colleagues used to say, we're working on the bleeding edge because we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> and in 2000, even with email, right? Like we didn't necessarily really know what we're doing. And the nice part is now there's a roadmap. We know what we're doing. We know how to do these things. We know what works. And there are amazing people. Many of them are OI members, you know. Know, Chad White, Ryan Phelan, mm. and myself. I can't, it's Path Pay, Callan Taravera. We're all writing about this stuff. It's out there. There's the OI blog. There's so many blogs. You guys, I'm sure, have a blog. And just don't try to go it alone. Google email marketing automation, see what comes up, read what people are doing. There's a lot of case studies on automation on my blog and learn from those of us who have been doing it, because that's going to help you get over some of the initial challenges and the initial humps. And you're not on the bleeding edge anymore with email. There's a roadmap. So that's the other thing I would say, leverage the content that's out there. There's so much good content. I feel like it's quite a while since I've heard anyone use bleeding edge, but I think everyone's going to know exactly what you mean. Now, listen, we like to finish up with a couple of sort of quick fire hot takes Danielle's got a question for you. I do. We're switching it up from our past episodes, everybody. I thought about this question and I myself was cringing because I was thinking about my own example Uh here. (laughs) It's bad. Jean, what is the most embarrassing email address that you've had in the past? Yeah. So I'm embarrassed because I can't really think of one. You've survived it then, because Uh, I swear, all of my friends and I, well, man, we had some brutal, brutal examples. Oh, well, I can think of one, actually. Earlier, I was like, I haven't had any of those. Actually, oh, God, this is sort of embarrassing. So I'm a big hockey fan. So one of the emails that I've got that I, I don't use it much anymore, I'm sure it's still out there in the ether, it was Zamboni Babe. (laughs) I think it was at AOL.com. I think it's that old. Yeah, I was like, oh, yeah, that's my handle, Zamboni Babe. So that is pretty embarrassing. I don't really use that anymore. Thank goodness. I'm with you. My most embarrassing one was Dancing Barbie, but there were (laughs) two underscores in there. So I thought, how cool, right? I've got two underscores. Oh, man. (laughs) <laughs> We're going to throw one more at you just because we want to. This one's not quite as quirky, but, um, you know, you talk about all of the different trends which get written about on our blogs, on Only Influencers. And, you know, some of them are on the money and some of them are really overhyped. You know, what do you reckon is a big overhyped email trend right now? Oh, you know, I, I think that the big one right now, and I'm sure you're all feeling it too, is AI, chat mm-hmm. GPT. You know, we're not going to need copywriters anymore. Well, I think if you're a copywriter, your job's safe for at least five years, if not more. I think that's a big one for me right now. Yeah, I just, don't get me wrong. There's a place for it, but it's not always right. And I had a friend whose son wanted to get into Georgetown where I'm an alum and I teach. And so I wrote him a recommendation and I actually had ChatGPT write the first draft of it. 
And it was fine, but it was a little generic. And then I wrote what I was going to write. And I sent them both to him and asked him which one he'd prefer. And he chose mine. I was very thankful for that. And I did steal a few turns of phrase from the chat GPT. There were some things I'm like, oh, that's an interesting way to state that. But yeah, I think there's still a need for human touch. You know, the other thing, and I'm sorry, I, I can't believe we've talked this long and I haven't mentioned it, but The other real problem we're seeing with automations these days is what MPP did to open rates. Mm. And MPP now, if it goes to an Apple device, they're automatically going to open it. You're going to get an open. There was always a margin of error in open rates, but now it's much larger. But I was recently working with a client and they had some automations that were based on people who had opened but had not clicked. And the problem we were getting is there's so much static in that metric now. Because it says that they opened, but a lot of them didn't open. A lot of people's metrics went up, but open rate went up by 50%, 70%. So that's another thing. If you're running automations, you should check anything that has anything to do with an open as a piece of logic, because it's just not relevant anymore. And that's something that we really need to take a look at. And that's something you need to think about when you're putting your automations together. Not that it was ever a perfect metric. It wasn't, but it's way imperfect now, especially in the deliverability space. If you're taking those open as as a sign that there's a person there and they're interested and engaged, that could not be more wrong these days. Sorry to go out of sync with Oh, not at all. I think you've just served up a topic that's going to bring you back for another episode of Email After Hours in the weeks to come. But I think we're going to have to um, tie it up for today. Danielle, you want to see us home? This has been such a pleasure, Jean. You are such a wealth of knowledge. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we can't wait to have you back to chat MPP. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. This has just been such a pleasure. So yeah, I, I hope to see you all in Vegas this summer in June at the Email Innovation Summit. And um, if you ever get to DC, let me know. We'll grab coffee and talk email. Sounds great. Be sure to tune in next time and hit subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. To all you sleepless senders out there, thank you for joining us after hours and see you next time.